Hello and welcome to your clinical orientation. My name is Steve Jones. I'm the clinical coordinator here at Georgia Institute of EMS. We're going to take the next 30 minutes or so and talk about the clinical, clinical rotations that you will be attending, whether you're an EMT or an AMT. The lecture should take about 30 minutes and we're going to talk about what you should expect prior, during, and after your clinical rotations. So let's get started. The first page in your clinical handbook is the clinical checklist. The clinical checklist is there for you to use so that you will be able to, to keep up with what documentation you have gathered prior to attending your clinical rotation. All this information will, be need, will need to be gathered, signed, filled out, completed, and turned in to me prior to you attending your clinicals. Things such as the authorization to release information, the Georgia Institute of EMS Accident Waiver and Release of Liability Form, the Transport America Release of Liability Form, the American Medical Response Release of Liability Form, and the Central EMS Intern Form are all sheets in the clinical handbook that you need to complete, sign, and turn in with your clinical packet. The immunizations that you will need to gather are your measles, mumps, and rubella. It's a two-shot series. You should have both. Proof that you've had a vaccination for varicella or that you've actually had the chicken pox. All we need in that case is just the year that you had the chicken pox. Your tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. It needs to be within 10 years. If it's not within 10 years, then you need to get a booster shot you can get them at your primary health care provider or you can go to the health department your hepatitis B series is a three shot series you can either have that or if you don't have your vaccination records you could pull titers for your MMRs your varicella and your hep B the influenza vaccination is required if we are in the current flu season. If we are not in the current flu season, then you will not be required to get an influenza vaccination. Your PPD or chest x-ray, this is your TB skin test. It tests for tuberculosis. If you've been exposed to it in the past, it will show up positive. You will need to get a chest x-ray with the letter stating that you have a clear chest x-ray. All this needs to be within 90 days of starting your clinical rotations. The next part is your pre-background check. You can get, you can log on to the website and I'll show you how to get to it here shortly. You'll need a drug screen. You'll need your malpractice insurance, your health care provider card, your health care provider card, if you are an EMT, you will be able to obtain it when you take your CPR lab. You'll need a copy of your driver's license and a copy of your high school diploma, GED, or transcripts. You'll need to watch the safety orientation and the infectious control videos. All right, so the clinical portion of any EMS program of study is the most exciting portion of the EMT or AEMT course. That's why it is critical that you adhere to the existing policies and that you accomplish 100% of the clinical requirements in order to successfully complete the course. We can follow the link below for vital information regarding your clinical rotation. Well, I thought we could. Evidently, we can't. Let's see. Nope. All right, so what you need to do is log on to the Georgia Institute of EMS website, click on current students, then you will scroll down past where you log into the course room, and the next part is your EMS and ER clinical information. Down below it is a link. It says EMT and AEMT clinical information. You'll click on it. 
and then it says please read the entire page before starting any of the steps below so step one you want to get your background check if you click on the link it will take you to the website and you can order your background check please we put this one first because it takes sometimes two to three weeks and it could take even longer if you've lived in multiple states or out of the country we need to schedule your drug screen we offer drug screens at the school usually twice during the class the cost is forty dollars and it is cash only it's not forty five dollars and you need to order your clinical shirt you'll click on the link you'll go to the order form and you will get your order your shirt I don't know the exact price but I'm sure it is on the website you'll also need the following for your uniforms you'll need black or navy pants you can get them from Dickies you can get a pair of Dickies from Walmart they're inexpensive you don't have to spend a lot of money on your uniform you don't know which service you're going to go to you don't know what they're going to require if you go out and buy a $60 pair of 5.11's you may not be able to wear them so please just buy something to get by during class and then once you decide where you're going to work who you're going to work for if you are planning on working in the field then go out and buy you a set of pants that are compatible with the uniform at that site or that organization you'll need black EMS style boots or shoes all they have to be is they need to be black they need to be polishable and we recommend that they be at least six inches so that it will protect your angle, ankles over uneven ground a black belt that is void of any decorations a watch with a second hand or digital output that shows the seconds the next step is you want to get your TB test done you can get them at any of the healthcare center departments you can get them from your primary care whoever you want to get them to it does not matter as long as you get one and you get it turned in to us prior to you attending your clinical rotation you need to provide evidence of your immunizations which is your hep B, your varicella, your MMRs, your Tdap everything that is listed on that clinical checklist in the front of the clinical handbook step six says download the following documents to your computer and read every page this is the student clinical handbook please do not load this one it is out of date and has information in it that you do not need and it is missing information that you do need if you have not received your clinical handbook please shoot me an email at steve at g-a-i-e-m-s dot com and I will be happy to forward you the latest and greatest version of the clinical handbook you do need to follow step seven and watch the entire video it's a safety video and it goes over information that you will need during your clinical orientation for wearing proper protective equipment keeping yourself safe things like that step nine make a copy of your CPR card if you are an AEMT student and you're just now joining us you will need to provide a copy of your CPR card you also need to supply us with a copy of your EMTB National Registry step 10 you want to obtain your student medical malpractice insurance click on the link healthcare provider service organization make sure that you put that you are a student if you do not put a student it could have higher premiums if you put a student I think it's somewhere around 38 bucks for a year make sure that you download the binder page which is the sheet that tells you what your coverage is once you download it into a PDF format please email it to me and anything that you can digitally scan and email to me the better off you're going to be that way you have the originals you have a digital copy I have a digital copy I will print them out and put them in your file 
you need to put play, get some kind of folder or paper clips or alligator clips, whatever you want to get. Put all of your stuff together and turn it into me. I have a box just outside of my office or office door. Please feel free to put it in there at any time. I'm usually in the office two to three days a week, and I will go through it and make sure that you have everything. If you're missing anything, I will shoot you an email. So next, once you have all of that done, we will check, shoot me an email saying that you're ready to start your clinical rotations. I'll make sure that you've completed all of your required labs. I'll make sure that you are caught up in your course room and I will check with the financial officer and make sure that you are financially ready to start your clinical rotations. Make sure you have your uniform clean, pressed, and ready to work and arrive at your clinical site on time. So that is a general breakdown of everything that you are going to need. And it is, the link is right beside it. You have your course room here, and then you have your EMT, AMT, clinical information on the next link down. Drug screens. A lot of people live far away, two to three hours, some of them further than that. The furthest we've had a student come from is London, England. But you can get your drug screen from other than the school. We do offer the testing. It is $40 cash. She comes to us. You get your drug screen. She sends the results directly back to us, which maintains the chain of custody. You can use any lab now. There is a sheet in the clinical handbook that has a lot of different locations within the metro Atlanta area that you can use. You just need to make sure that you tell them or any other lab that you decide to use that the drug screen has to be a 10 panel and it has to be with values. They'll know exactly what you mean and the results have to be emailed directly to me to preserve the chain of custody. You may use your primary care provider, but just remember, they sometimes don't like to do outside drug screens, and they definitely don't like to email the results directly to me. They would prefer to give them to you because you are the one that is requesting them. We have to maintain that chain of custody to satisfy the clinical sites. Liability release and other significant forms you need to worry about. The American Medical Response Release of Liability, AMR, EMS, requires that you sign the release of liability prior to performing your clinical rotation with them. Transport America is the same way. American Medical Response is located in DeKalb County. They are a 911 service, which means they run all the emergency calls in DeKalb County, and they're headquartered in Stone Mountain. Transport America is a private company that is located in Millersville, Georgia, and they do a lot of inter-hospital, uh, nursing home, psychiatric transports, and dialysis transports. They are a private company and they do not run any emergency calls. The Georgia Institute of EMS release of liability form is a general release of liability that says that you will hold harmless. Anybody from Georgia Institute of EMS, if anything happens to you while you are at the school and or on your clinical rotation. The authorization to release information form is the information that we need to release to the clinical sites or to the state office of EMS so that you'll be able to get cleared to test for your national registry exams. We do not give this information out and we do not take your information lightly. We protect it in any manner we can. The hepatitis B vaccination declination form is if you do not did not receive your hepatitis B vaccination, the three shot series, and you do not want to get that three shot series, you can sign this declination form and you will not have to obtain 
that series of shots. It does not relieve you from the rest of them that are required, but it can re release you from having to get that hepatitis B, which you'll normally takes about a year to get this three shot series and would hold you up from attending clinical rotations. The Central EMS intern form, if you're interested in going to work with Central EMS, you ride with them, you have a great experience, fill this, in, this intern form out, send it to me. I will scan it and email it to the hiring committee at Central EMS. When they see your application come by and they see that you attended school here, then they will look and see if they have one of these intern forms. They will pull it. They will talk to the preceptors you rode with, and they will find out from them if they think you are a good fit for the company. All right, the guidebook itself to the clinical and field rotations. You have some prerequisites that you need to meet before attending clinical hours. They include, you have to have a completed clinical file, which is everything that we just talked about that needs to be turned in. You have to have completed your required labs. For the EMT portion, you have to have a minimum of two trauma labs, two medical labs, and your CPR lab. You have had to have completed satisfactorily the required coursework. That means you need to be caught up, not catching up. You need to be caught up in your coursework so that you have an understanding of your trauma assessments and your medical assessments prior to attending clinical rotations. You should have already obtained your required clinical uniform, including your gray polo shirt. The shirt will have the GAIEMS logo on one side, your first initial and last name on the other side. This is your identification. It says that you are a student at our school that way the preceptors know and the patients know that you are a student. Any site specific identification badge or parking permit as required. When you look on the clinical handbook, you'll see all of our clinical sites listed and out to the right in parentheses will be any special information that you will need to know, including whether or not they require an identification badge or parking permit or both. You need to meet all of your financial obligations as described in the Georgia Institute of EMS contractual agreement. The dress code for attending clinicals, you need to be wearing your approved Georgia Institute of EMS clinical shirt. It must be tucked in and pressed. Remember, when you are out there and you're doing your clinicals, it is just like you're on a job interview as well. You're there to learn, but you're also there to tell them that you are professional and interested in the business if you're ever planning on working in the service. Your black or navy pants, your black or navy socks, black boots, polishable, and recommended a minimum of six inches. You'll need a black belt, a wristwatch with a second hand, it can be analog or digital, an orange or yellow reflective highway vest. It has to be worn anytime you get out of the vehicle on any public street, road, highway, or interstate inside the state of Georgia. If you're caught by the Department of Transportation without it in those areas, you may be fined up to $10,000 for not wearing it. Please, it's not worth it. Buy the vest, wear the vest, and everything will be fine. If it is going to be cooler weather, you may want to wear a black or navy jacket, a windbreaker. It cannot have any insignia, logo, other service, fire department. It has to be just a plain black navy jacket or windbreaker. You may wear a black or navy turtleneck sweater under your polo. Personal hygiene. Your hair must be of a natural color. It must be neat and it cannot touch the collar. Facial hair with the exception of mustaches are not allowed. If you have a mustache, it must be neat, 
and not extend past the corner of the mouth by more than one quarter inch. Women's hair must be pulled up if the length is past the collar of the shirt. We recommend that it be pulled up and put into a tight bun. This is for your safety. Fingernails must be neat and clean, and nail polish of any kind is not allowed, including clear. Acrylic nails must be removed prior to attending clinical rotations. All visible piercings must be removed, and visible tattoos must be covered at all times during the clinical rotations. For safety reasons, bracelets, necklaces, earrings, and other jewelry shall not be worn during clinical rotation. One pair of stud earrings for women are the only thing that are allowed as well as wedding bands. Patients are often sensitive to strong odors or scents. Students may not wear perfume, cologne, or aftershave. These odors can cause COPD exacerbation or cause asthma attacks. Always present yourself in a professional manner. EMS is a very small community and it doesn't take long for word to spread if you are not the kind of professional they are looking for. Your required clinical items that you will need to take with you, naturally your uniform, you'll need to take your clinical paperwork. We'll go over that at the end, but you want to make sure that you take enough clinical paperwork with you so that you don't run out. If it is, if you're required to have an ID card, which is site specific, again, check the clinical handbook next to the sites. If it is required, it will be beside the clinical site in parentheses. You'll need to take a stethoscope with you. You'll need to take a wristwatch with a second hand analog or digital, your reflective vest, a pen light, and a per parking permit if it is required for the site. When you're ready to schedule your clinical rotations, you'll review the clinical sites listed in the clinical handbook. You want to pick the clinical site that you would like to attend, the dates that you would like to attend, and the times that you would like to attend if it is applicable. Send it to me at steve at gaiems.com and I will schedule you on a first come, first serve basis. We have multiple classes going on, so sites can get filled up rather quickly. Please do not wait until the last minute to do your clinical rotations. You may not have a slot to be able to get into, so please start as early as possible. Cancellation of any clinical rotation is highly frowned upon by the clinical sites, except in cases of true emergencies. You may be subject to a missed clinical fee. That is the reason you have scheduled the dates around your schedule and have taken a slot that could have been used by another student. Once you schedule the dates, please do everything in your power to make sure that you attend the clinicals as scheduled. Do not call the clinical site to counsel or attempt to reschedule a clinical rotation. They will not do it and they will call me. So please do not do it. All requests for clinical scheduling must go through the clinical coordinator, coordinator via email at steve at gaiems.com. Your shift requirements, you need to arrive at least 15 minutes prior to the start of the shift. You do not leave your clinical site until the end of the clinical rotation. You want to make sure that you bring money for food. You can bring a sack lunch. You can bring water, protein, or granola bars. The shifts are 12-hour shifts, and from the time you get there to the time you go home, you may not have an opportunity to stop. Please take, be prepared. Take something with you that you'll have to drink or eat. When you arrive on location, you want to inform the crew of your name, the level of training, and you want to interact appropriately, including participating in any chores that need to be performed, such as washing the unit, cleaning the station, preparing meals. Whatever it is that crew is doing, you should be involved in it. You want to become familiar with the ambulance that you are assigned to and learn what and where equipment is kept and used for. 
You want to ask questions. You want to perform tasks without having to be prompted. You are there to learn. You're there to polish the skills that you have learned. Please take advantage of your clinical rotation. You want to use any downtime for asking questions and studying. You want to have all your clinical paperwork completed and signed before the end of the shift. No tobacco use of any kind is permitted, including e-cigarettes while you're attending clinical rotations. Only use your cell phones in case of emergencies. You want to follow and abide by all Privacy Acts and HIPAA laws. Follow all safety precautions and policies of the clinical site. You want to direct any questions to the clinical coordinator or preceptor at the clinical site. The EMT clinical rotation forms, these are the forms that you're going to need to take with you to your clinical site and have them filled out and completed before the end of the shift. The EMT clinical tally sheet, you have, the requirements are you have to have a minimum of 10 patient contacts. You have to have a minimum of 24 hours on an ambulance. One of the things about those 10 patient contacts or 24 hours if you use a bag valve mask device to ventilate an apneic patient, this is a skill set that can be carried over and count towards your AEMT skill sets. This is one of the hardest ones to get, so please take advantage of it, be aggressive, and make sure that you document it. This is the EMT clinical rotation tally sheet. If you will notice, there are room for four patients. You have to have a minimum of 10, which means that you have to have a minimum of three sheets. You want to put your name, the date, the time you started, and the time you left your clinical. On the left hand side, you have your special populations. All of your juvenile patients are listed. Your adult patients are listed here. Your geriatric patients are just below. So if you are, your first patient is a one to three year old, then you would initial in the box beside the one to three year old and your preceptor would initial next to your initials. Then you would go down to the pathologies. What is wrong with the child? They are having difficulty breathing which is normal for children. You would go down to respiratory. You would initial under the same patient and your preceptor would initial. Remember, you can only have one pathology per patient. Your assessments, you have a difficulty breathing and it is a pediatric patient, then you would go down to dyspnea which is difficulty breathing pediatric. You will initial and your preceptor will initial. If you do any other assessments that you feel are necessary, such as general weakness, you can initial it and your preceptor can initial it. You can have as many assessments as you deem necessary, but only one pathology per patient. For example, you have a 67-year-old male complaining of chest pains and difficulty breathing. It would be a geriatric call. He would be your second patient. You would initial, your preceptor would initial, and it would be a cardiac patient. You would initial, your preceptor would initial. You get assessments. They're having chest pain. You would set initial beside the chest pain assessment. Your preceptor would initial beside your initials. Difficulty breathing, you assess for that. You initial, your preceptor initials. They have general weakness and they have dizziness. They may be syncope. So you could have four or five assessments for that one cardiac pathology. When you've completed this sheet, 
you will init, you will sign it, and the preceptor will sign it. The next form you need to fill out is the patient care report. You need to have one patient care report for each patient on an ambulance. You want to use the SOT format to write your PCR. You never want to write anything in the PCR that could identify the patient, not their address, not their name, anything like that. Just non-identifying demographic information. So, you write your narrative and you do your subjective information, which is what the patient tells you. Your objective information is what you discover about the patient and then the treatment and transport of what you do for the patient and the outcome of interventions and location the patient was transported to. This is the patient care report. You want to put the patient's age, their sex, the date, the county the call originated in, and put your SOT information in the narrative. Right below that, you want to put your vital signs, the time, the blood pressure, pulse, respirations, and their mental status. Are they alert? Are they alert to verbal? Are they alert to painful? Are they alert to are they unresponsive? So in this box, you would have one letter. It would be an A, a V, a P, or a U. You want to do it every five minutes for unstable patients and repeat your assessment every 15 minutes for stable patients. Print your name, sign your name, your preceptor will print their name, and they will sign their name. The next page you're going to need to get filled out is the Clinical Preceptor Student Evaluation Form. They will be looking at your skills and evaluating them, assessing them on a 1 to 3 grading scale. If they give you a 1, that means that you failed to perform procedures in a competent manner and that you are not professional. If they give you a 2, you're inconsistent in your performing skills in a competent manner and you are inconsistent in professional behavior. Number three, you consistently perform procedures in a safe and competent manner and you display good professional attributes. Evaluation forms are to be used for constructive criticism of students' abilities with the recommendations by their preceptor on best how to improve in weak areas. They will use these evaluations to grade you and not only grade you but also use them to give you ideas of what your weaknesses are, what your strengths are, and how you can improve in any weak areas. They'll grade you on how you perform patient assessments, including your history taking and physical exam, if you can formulate a correct treatment plan and verbalize an appropriate rationale. You verbalize pathophysiology, assisting with chores, you can perform the skills that are within your scope of practice using proper and safe, safe techniques. Display a professional attitude and appearance at all times. You want to show punctuality throughout the rotation. You're self-motivated and uses any downtime during the day to learn and study. Ask them questions. It shows that you're interested. Display self-confidence and displays appropriate communication skills. The second page of the evaluation form is any remediation, remediation that the preceptor feels that you will need to do. If you have skills that you need to perform, such as history taking, uh, physical examinations, gathering sample history or medications, whatever it is that you need to improve on, your preceptor should put that here. They will give a description of their concerns and they will give you an idea of what you can do to improve it. They should go over this with you before you leave for the day. They will sign it and date it. You will sign it and date it and you will turn it in with your clinical documentation. 
All right, so that's the EMT portion. There's not much difference between the EMT clinical paperwork and the AEMT clinical paperwork, except you have to have more patient contacts, you have to have successful IVIO attempts, medication administrations, and you have to have a successful team lead on an ambulance. Also, you have to have specific patient assessments, not just random for any. So, for your patient contacts, you have to have five pediatric, five adult, and five geriatric. You need 10 successful IV or IO attempts. And when we talk about successful intravenous, you can also count a successful blood draw. You are getting into the vein system and taking blood out. So it does count as successful intravenous, intravenous access. 10 medication administrations. Remember, you can give any medication that your preceptor allows. It doesn't have to be just the ones within your scope of practice. If you are with a paramedic, you can give any drug that they can give as long as you are in a student capacity. If you are with an RN, you can give any medication they give as long as they are with you and they are your preceptor. The successful team lead, you have to have one of those. It can only be performed on an ambulance. And it is when you take charge of that patient from beginning to end. You have to access one chest pain patient at a minimum, one respiratory distress patient, and one altered mental status patient. Altered mental status is somebody who has seizures, somebody who has a stroke, somebody who is on has a psychiatric event. So they are just not in their right mind due for whatever reason. The tally sheet is exactly the same except for down at the bottom. Down at the bottom is where you will document your skill sets. If you ventilate an unintubated patient with a bag valve mask device, you'll go to where the patient is listed on your tally sheet. You will initial and your preceptor will initial stating that you have completed that skill. Medication administration, same thing. You will initial, your preceptor will initial. If you have a patient who requires multiple medications, if they need a breathing treatment and epinephrine for an anaphylaxis reaction, or Benadryl. You can say that in the block where that patient is listed, you could put a times two in your initials for two medications given, and then initial it beside it, and the preceptor will initial beside it, stating that you did give those two medications. Same thing for IV access. A lot of departments or organizations require that you give Two, you have two intravenous access sites for cardiac and trauma patients. You would put times two, initial it, and your preceptor would initial it. If you do a team lead, same thing, you would initial it and your preceptor would initial it. Whenever you do any of these, your tally sheets have to match your PCRs. So all of your narratives should contain what medications you give, what routes you gave them, where the IV sites were located, if you gave bilateral lines, what gauge needle did you use, did you use an IMT, did you put them in the AC, did you put them in the hand, where did you put them so that you can document that. The next page you're going to use is an emergency department or urgent care clinic documentation. Any patient that you see on an ambulance has to have a PCR. 
any patient that you see in an urgent care or emergency department setting has to have one of these sheets. This sheet contains the type of patient, whether it is a medical, trauma, cardiac. This is your pathology. What type of patient is it? The next part is your basic patient information, the age, the sex, the chief complaint, the history, etc. The skills you perform. Did you do, what type of assessment did you do? What were the vital signs? What type of medication did you give? Did you do blood draws? Did you give IV medications? Did you start a line? That's where all your skills go. Your patient disposition, were they transferred to a hospital? Were they discharged home with a prescription? Did they get transferred to a specialty hospital? Whatever, did they get admitted to the hospital? Whatever happened to that patient, that is what is your disposition. This sheet counts as your PCR in this setting only. So if you're in urgent care, you do not have to fill out your PCRs for these patients. You want to make sure that you fill it out completely and that you get it signed. So put your name, the date, the time in, the time out, your preceptor's name, and the clinical site, whether it is a hospital or an urgent care clinic. And this is what the sheet looks like. So you have enough room for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight patients on each sheet. So you don't have to do the PCRs, but you can keep up with your patient load adequately. We've already talked about the PCRs. They have to be one for each patient on an ambulance. It is the only place you can do your team lead is on an ambulance. You cannot do it in an urgent care clinic. The clinical preceptor evaluation form is the same form that we use for the EMT and is set for the same reason. It is for a positive feedback from your preceptor over the day's events. And it looks exactly the same. All right, so now We've successfully completed the course, now what do we do? Well, once we've completed all of our labs, all of our coursework, and all of our clinical requirements, then we want to successfully complete the psychomotor exam. If you're an AEMT, note that the new rules require that you successfully complete the EMT psychomotor and written exam prior to taking the AEMT psychomotor exam. You want to create an account on the NREMT.org website. We will submit all of your information to the state. Once they have reviewed your file, they will clear you to test and you can take the National Registry EMT written exam. You want to notify the school that you are ready to take the exam by contacting Tom Camplain at tom at gaiems.com so that he can clear you to test on the National Registry website. Schedule and take your written National Registry exam. You will have to complete your psychomotor and written exam before you can take your psychomotor exam for AMT. You also have up to ten, two years to complete your psychomotor and written exam. Anything past that two year span, you have to take the entire course over again if you do not complete. I hope this has helped you in understanding what is going to happen prior to, during, and after your clinical rotations. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me, steve at G-A-I-E-M-S. I always try to do my best to get back to you within 24 hours. If I don't get back to you, please call me on the phone, leave me a message saying that you've tried to contact me, but I haven't received it. 24 hours is 24 hours. Don't send it at midnight and expect me to answer you and then at noon, you're calling me on the phone. You gotta give me some time to respond. We all work other jobs and if I'm on a call at the fire department, I may not be able to get back right back to you. 
but I promise I will just as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that you have a pleasant clinical experience. Thank you very much.